Okay, we're going to pray. I'm going to give you a darb. And um, we're going to finish up this lecture on the woman caught in adultery. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for these students. I pray, Father, as we walk through this story, that we wouldn't just see it as a story about um, some woman caught in adultery, but we, what we would see um, our own sin and our own need of you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, somebody named Paul Fix. I have no idea who Paul Fix is. Said this. The only reason some people get lost in thought is because it's unfamiliar territory. To do you get the whole like connection to being lost in unfamiliar territory, and then also your thinking. Would you want to do games with an eraser, that kind of thing? So I was thinking like maybe we could do like watch like clips of Jim Gaff again for your audience sure. now. Like no. Why not? Because we have other things to do. Uh, okay, so um, take out the notes that I gave you yesterday, please. What? And we're going to start back at the beginning. Angela and Toby, we started to film this yesterday, and my storage was full, so I cleared out storage. And now, now you're there, so we're going to uh, begin from the beginning. Where is your, what have, you, what have I asked you to do? Thank you. This would be the Come on. Come on. So this story of the woman caught in adultery found ostensibly, that's our new word of that. It's not up there yet, but I copied it off today, ostensibly. Uh, I'll hang it up. Probably next hour. Um, it, ostensibly, it begins at John 7, 53, uh, although the real story begins at John 8, um, 1. And it goes through John 8, 11. So we're going to talk about these two different words. And the words are authenticity and veracity. They, are, they do not mean the same thing. And it's important for us to make this distinction uh, with this story. Uh, they are two different things. Veracity means truthfulness. So if Elijah, who had a very good game tonight, came to me and said, I scored 1,000 points at last night's game, I might question the veracity of that statement, of the truthfulness of that statement. Even though he was drinking threes pretty, pretty good. Um, so uh, that veracity means truthfulness, authenticity, with regard to the Bible, uh, means that in the, in the case of this story, means that this story was written by John at the same time as the rest of the gospel. There are two different things. Um, and, and this story uh, can be uh, true without being authentic. It be authentic without being true. Um, and so for there are reasons, as I told you in the In Search um, worksheet, there's, there are reasons for questioning the authenticity of this story. In other words, there are reasons for questioning that it was written by John at the same time as the rest of John. 
Actually, those are two separate things. There are reasons to believe that it was not written by John, and there are reasons to believe that it was not written at the same time as John. What are those reasons? I told you I would tell you those reasons. Uh, first of all, the earliest manuscripts omit it. It's not in the earliest manuscripts. Manuscripts are copies of parts or of scripture, books of scripture, or a whole um, Bible, whole New, whole New Testament. And um, copies were made from those copies. We'll spend a lot of time uh, next year and the year after talking about that process and is the Bible reliable? That's not my, it's just, you know, a little spoiler alert, it is reliable. Um, but we'll, we'll get into all that. Uh, that's not my purpose here. But the earliest manuscripts, so the manuscripts we have that are closest to the original, and in some cases, those manuscripts may have been copied from the original, but those that are closest to the original, this story isn't in them. The story isn't there. It's, it begins to show up in later manuscripts. Um, so the earliest copies we have of John don't have this story. The earliest commentaries on John omit it. So when someone like Eusebius or Irenaeus, early church fathers, wrote their commentaries on John, they didn't comment on this story. Now they maybe didn't comment on the story because, and we'll talk about this more later, because of the content of the story, but I believe it's more likely that they didn't comment on the story because the story wasn't in their Bible. They didn't know they, they may have known of the story, but they didn't know of it in John. Does that make sense? Because at that point, it wasn't in John. Um, in later manuscripts, the story is found in different locations in John. Here it's, uh, in our Bible, it's you know the end of seven into the first 11 verses of eight, but it, it, it bounces around in John. And, and in some manuscripts, it's even in Luke. So in a different gospel altogether. Fourthly, this, um, this story breaks up the narrative of John. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean. If you would please open your Bibles uh, to John 7. And we see at the end of John 7, um, Jesus has been at the Feast of Tabernacles. And he's been teaching about how he, that anyone who comes to him, living water will flow out of them. He is the source of living water, connected to the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, and, the, and the Feast of Tabernacles light ritual, or excuse me, uh, water ritual. And then it says um, in... Um, Eight, or excuse me, in 753, which is part of what has been added. That, that's not in the earliest manuscripts. 753 is not in the earliest manuscripts. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him. Okay, so it's saying that happened. They all went home. Jesus comes back to the temple the next day. Now, look at 812. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That follows on um, 752 much better than this story. Here's why. They replied, I'm in 752. They replied, are you from Galilee too? To, to Nicodemus, who defended Jesus. Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Again, Jesus spoke to them, same crowd. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the reason why, not only does that follow well, uh, much better than, neither do I condemn you, go from now and go, uh, and from now on sin no more. At that point, it's just Jesus and the woman. Everybody else has walked away. And we're supposed to believe that Jesus again says, now says, I am the light of the world to no one, right? Or just to the woman. That doesn't make much sense, does it? And it makes even more sense that it follows from 752 because there was also a light ritual. 
during the Feast of Tabernacles. And they would light up, they would light up Jerusalem. It was almost like, you know, the, the houses that you see that are just over the top with Christmas lights, you know, and, and, and it's like the whole place is lit up. That's what Jerusalem was like during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, and so he is, he is again saying, I am the fulfillment, I am the Messiah, I'm the fulfillment of those prophecies. I am the light of the world. That makes sense. So this story just kind of is shoehorned in here um, in, a, in a place where it really doesn't fit. So it breaks up the flow of the narrative in John. And then finally, well, no, 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 not finally, but fifthly, the language and the grammar of this story are very different than any of John's other writings. A number of words uh, in this story are found nowhere else in John's writing. But they are found in the Synoptic Gospels. And in fact, its style is more like the Synoptic Gospels as well. Now, how can we say, well, yeah, but maybe he just used different words. I'm going to read two things to you. Uh, the first one is very, I don't even know why I'm turning back to this. because I'm just gonna, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the, that life was the light of men. Now I'm going to turn to 1 John, the opening of 1 John. <coughs> and this is how John opens 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has been made manifest to us. written by the same guy. Um, another example is Hebrews. Some people think Paul wrote Hebrews. And I remember hearing years ago that Paul didn't write Hebrews. It didn't sound like Paul. It wasn't written like Paul writes. And I thought, oh, how do you know the way Paul writes? Well, after studying, you know, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, and, and all of those books of Paul, and then I, then I taught Hebrews. And I start reading Hebrews, and I'm like, oh, this ain't Paul. This doesn't sound anything like Paul. This story doesn't sound anything like John. But it does sound like the synoptics. It is very similar in style and in theme to the synoptic gospels. So it appears, at least to me, that this story is not authentic. In other words, it's not original to the gospel of John doesn't mean it's untrue. So is it a true story? Uh, what about the veracity of this story? Well, first of all, it is a very early story. In fact, the church's very first historian, Eusebius, learned the story from Papias, who lived during the time of the gospel writer. So the story is as old as the stories in the gospel, in the other gospels, um, in all the gospels. And it's very typical of the types of stories found in the synoptic gospels. So you've got this story of, um, written down by Eusebius and handed orally from Papias to Eusebius, who is essentially a, a, a um, contemporary of the gospel writers. Well, it's like your grandmother telling you a story about your mother. You wouldn't quite, unless your grandma's, you know, woo-hoo, you wouldn't, you wouldn't question the veracity of that story, would you? So it's a very early story. Um, but it was left out of the canon. Why? Why didn't the synoptic uh, writers write about this story? What do you think? Why would they leave it out? No. I 
I think it's because of the nature of the story itself. Jesus is showing mercy to a woman caught in sin, sexual sin. Such a thing was unheard of in Jesus' day and in the second century and the third century and the fourth century. And to, show, to show mercy on one who would commit adultery. You just didn't do that. So not only is there the sexual nature of this story, but there's also Jesus who said some things that might have sounded crazy to people, but of all the crazy things he said, this would be the craziest. What? She's been caught in the act, and you're offering her mercy? The story probably made church leaders a little uncomfortable for both those reasons. Um, so to sum up, um, this, I believe, is a true story. It actually happened. Jesus actually said and did what this story says. So I believe it's a true story that somehow got misplaced in John. I also believe there's much that we can learn from this story. So because of that, those two things, we will st uh, study and apply it just as we have all, all the other true stories in John's Gospel. Just understanding that this one wasn't written by John. But I believe it's just as true as everything that was written by John. So the story begins in John 7, 53 and ends in John 8, 11. And we're going to read this a little bit at a time. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the trap being set for Jesus. So he's just spoken with the, the people that made the Jews angry. And it says, they each went to their own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in, her, in, their, in the midst, right in front of him, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So they're trying to set a trap for Jesus. And they say she was caught in the act. That is a legal claim. They're saying that she was caught breaking the law. She has broken the law. And Jesus, you're the judge. You get to adjudicate this. Now, in any Jewish court of law, uh, they, in any court of law, evidence is needed. You have no evidence, you have no case. But in the Jewish court of law, here's the evidence that was needed. There needed to be at least two witnesses who saw the actual act at the same time and place, but did not participate in it. So, they had to have at least two witnesses, eyewitnesses, who saw what happened at, the, at that time in that place. And they were both, both at the same time and in the same place. Uh, but they didn't participate in it. They had no culpability in it. They were not party to it. So if uh, three guys knock off a jewelry store, and two guys say, he did it. Well, they're not legal witnesses because they participated in that robbery. Does that make sense? Um, so that's important as we move forward. So for this to be true, for these men who are accusing this woman, um, for, for their story to be true, they would have had to set up a trap for this woman. They would have had to set her up for this sin because they didn't just happen upon it. And I believe they did set a trap for her. They wanted to use her for their own power play against Jesus. They cared nothing about justice. 
justice was not their concern at all. And can I just say, it's a little dicey, but where's the guy in this? Um, as D.A. Carson says, tongue in cheek, adultery is not a sin that one commits in splendid isolation. It takes two to tango. But the man, particularly in a sexist society like first century uh, Ju uh, Jerusalem, the man's not their concern. Jesus is. They want to get him, and they'll go at any length to any lengths to do that. They could have brought her to him privately. If justice was their concern, they could have brought her to him privately. But again, that wouldn't have fit their agenda. Jesus knows exactly what they're doing. They're trying to trap him. Here's the trap. If Jesus refuses to uphold Mosaic law, if he says, no, don't stone him, he's a lawbreaker. And they can charge him with that. If he upholds Mosaic law, and says, yep, stone her. Not only would he be essentially signing, uh, excuse me, signing this woman's death warrant, when obviously he knew that they had set her up, but he would have supported a practice that at this point in time was not very popular. There were a lot of people even at that time that saw stoning as barbaric. And so if he had her stoned, his popularity in his ministry would suffer. Either way, the Pharisees get what they want. Either they can charge him, they can arrest him uh, and punish him, or his ministry dies, and he's not a threat anymore. Either way, they're good. <clears throat> so either way, they believed they had him trapped. Or did they? Here's Jesus' response. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So the $64,000 question in this story has always been, what was he writing? Tradition says he was writing a verse like Jeremiah 17, 13, which says, those who turn away from you, from God, will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Maybe he was writing that. Maybe he was writing another verse. Maybe he was writing the accuser's sins or the names of those in the crowd that had also committed adultery. Some people say he was just doodling to buy time for tempers to cool down or to avert his eyes from a woman who was possibly naked or close to him. The truth is, we don't know. But we do know what he says. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. What does that mean? Here's what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that they have to be sinless or the law would be pointless. None of us is sinless. Nobody in the crowd is sinless. According to Jewish law, the witnesses were to throw the first stone. So Jesus is saying any of them who are guiltless in this situation, they, they had no part in it, and have also never committed adultery, are the only ones qualified to participate in the stone. So they had to have no role in this woman committing adultery. And they all 
would have also had to never have committed adultery themselves. Both had to be true in order for them to throw a stone. Jesus cut to the quick of their consciences because Jesus knew that they were in fact guilty. Guilty of setting the woman up, of using and abusing her, and likely also guilty of adultery. Maybe even with that woman. So one by one, they walk away. Until Jesus and the woman are left alone. It's interesting that it says the older ones first. And there's a lot of question of why the older ones first. I think it's likely because they had lived more of life and maybe were a little wiser, a little less hot-headed. So Jesus offers the woman restoration. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. There is restoration in these verses. Make no mistake about it. The woman is guilty. But Jesus showers mercy upon her. And I believe her life was forever changed. You know how sometimes at the end of movies, the first one I think of is Remember the Titans? And they tell this story, and then at the end, they tell you where they are now or, or what happened to them after the movie. Uh, actually, I think Herman Boone died recently in the last year or two. I think so. Um, and so they tell you, you know, Julius is and where Gary Bertier is and all that. Um, I would love to know what happened to this woman. I would love to have the where is she now sort of thing because I believe Jesus changed her life. Um, this is what Dr. Gary Burge says about uh, this situation. The crisp ending captures the seriousness with which Jesus views sin and judgment. Even the sin of those who accuse the woman and his gracious forgiving outlook on those who are caught in sin's grip. Jesus, some, some people have claimed that Jesus is treating sin lightly here. Jesus is not treating sin lightly. In fact, he's forgiving her while calling her to obedience. There are two parts to that. Neither do I condemn you, which is another way of saying, I forgive you. But then he says, now go and leave your life of sin. That's what he offers to all of us. Uh, G.L. Borchardt said this, Sin is not treated lightly by Jesus, but sinners were offered opportunity to start life anew. It's the same offer he makes to us. And I believe we're to see ourselves in this woman. If we don't, maybe it's because our hearts have grown hard concerning our own sinfulness. So I entitled this last part of application, The Adulterous Woman and Me, and You. I'm not sure, sin is sin, sin is sin. I'm sure about that. But I'm not sure we actually believe that. That sin is sin. People try to excuse themselves. They say, well, I'm not that bad. I mean, I never killed anybody. As if anything else is not sin. But apart from Christ, all sin, any sin, separates us from God. I'm not an adulteress. But my sin nailed Jesus to the cross just as surely as anything that woman ever did, any sin she ever committed. Sometimes in the Old Testament, prophets were asked to live out a prophecy. 
to give an acted out prophecy to the people. Sometimes they prophesied with words and sometimes they prophesied with action. Such is the story of Hosea. And God came to the prophet Hosea and said, this is what you are to do. You are to go down to where the prostitutes are. You are to take a prostitute and bring her home, clean her up, and make her your wife. And so Hosea went down to the prostitutes and he found Gomer and he took her into his home and he cleaned her up and he married her. He made her his wife and they had children. And at some point, Gomer decided that she wanted to go back to her old way of life, so she left Hosea, went back to prostitution, and Hosea pursued her and took her and took her home and cleaned her off and took her as his wife again and loved her. And Hosea leaves again, or excuse me, Gomer leaves again, and Hosea once again pursues Gomer and takes her home and cleans her off and loves her and takes her as his bride. And what God says to Hosea is this, tell Israel that this is a picture of my people, that you have prostituted yourselves with other gods and with sin, and you have committed whoredom, and I know that is a strong word, but that's the word the Bible uses against me in sinning against me. The point of, the, uh, of, of Hosea, Hosea is this, all sin is whoredom against God. I'm a Bible teacher, but I'm a dirty, rotten sinner deserving hell just like everybody else. My sin is whoredom against God. And so is yours. I would suggest that if we don't, we're in danger of distorting what Christ has done for us. The enormity of the grace and mercy of God to go through the cross to save us. Again, Dr. Birch says this. Christ's forgiveness in each of our lives diminishes as we lose touch with the depth of our own sinfulness. When we no longer see ourselves in the drama of the woman, when we feel we are free from accusation and judgment, we lose sight of God's grace. Jesus is not simply committed to the requirements of the law, but to the care and transformation of the woman before him and every person who likewise brings a debt of sin into the circle where he sits, which is all of us. All of us. So, I've never committed adultery, but I'm an adulterous woman. We are all adulterous men and women. I have, in my sin, committed adultery against God. I've been unfaithful to him. And so have you. And that's also us in that circle of accusers. Look what you did. He needs to be punished. But Christ offers us forgiveness instead of condemnation. This is my prayer. May I never, may we never use the mercy of excuse our sin but rather may we by the power of the Holy Spirit he gives us leave our lives of sin let's pray Father it never fails to both astound and convict me this story this story of your mercy such as that woman. And yet, I am that woman. We are all that woman. Thank you. Thank you for cleaning us off and taking us home and loving us as your bride. We do love you.
we'll stop there for today and we'll pick up